Good afternoon. We are pleased to have you join us today for the continuation of our five-part Reopen Strong webinar series hosted by Digital Promises League of Innovative School. The League of Innovative Schools is Digital Promises flagship initiative and over the past 10 years have grown into a robust dynamic network of 114 public schools and 34 states representing over 3.5 million students. League members are committed to working together to improve student outcomes and solve the challenges facing K-12 students through innovative strategies, learning technology, and research. The League of Innovative School works to validate, champion, and scale innovative learning opportunities to advance equity and excellence for all learners. I am your host, Dwayne McClary, Director of the League of Innovative Schools. The pandemic has proved that strong relationships and consistent communication between schools and families and community members are vital to ensure that students are supported both in and out of the classroom. As students return to school buildings, how are districts continuing to engage families and community stakeholders in their decision making? Furthermore, how are districts specifically reaching out to support our families of English language learners and marginalized communities? In today's webinar, the League, the league members uh, will share what actions they are taking into strengthening their family and community partnerships. Before we begin, I want to share an outline and housekeeping rules. All attendees will, not, will be on mute and cannot talk and does not have talking capabilities. Please, if you have any questions, please put them uh, in the Q&A option below on the Zoom um, task pane uh, for our panelists as we go through the process of asking questions, answering questions. If you see or hear anything that you agree with, please feel free to show your support and adding your comments in the chat feature. For the first 40 minutes, I will moderate a discussion with our panelists. And for the last 20 minutes, we will shift to a town hall Q&A and you will be invited to drop your questions in the Q&A options for our panelists to answer your questions. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our panelists Let's welcome our League of Innovative School panelists, Mr. Uh, Gilday Crosswaite from Linwood Unified School Districts, Dr. Baron Davis from uh, Superintendent of Richland School District 2, and Ms. Michelle Rodriguez, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez from Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Welcome panelists. We're so excited to have you. So tell me, how's it, how's it going? How are you guys managing and coping? Well, doing well, continuing to focus on um, our families and, and our students to make sure that um, we start the year strong. Yeah, absolutely. And making sure that our student voices are front and center of all of our decisions and uh, doing whatever we can to support our staff who are directly working with their kids. Awesome. Just trying, to, <clears throat> trying to manage and, and ensure that all students have the opportunity to have access to uh, premier educational experiences. So really trying to protect um, a lot of instructional time this year. It's just been our focus. Yeah, oh wow, that's, that's so important. Uh, just to go ahead and dive right in. I want each of you to paint a picture of your district so that the audience kind of understand your district demographics. So telling us the number of students, where you're located, number of schools, et cetera. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Michelle. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we appreciate always um, being able to speak to the work um, that we do here at Pajaro Valley. So our mantra this year has is been um, PVUSD cares, um, whole child, whole family, whole community. Um, so this is us. So we um, serve a, a little bit over 20,000 students. Um, we have um, 33 schools that serves 66% um, of them are English learners. 81% um, are students of poverty, 14% um, special education. 16% um, of our students are um, termed homeless. Um, so, and then we are unique in that we have two migrant camps within our school district. So we have the Buena Vista and we have the San Andreas um, camp um, within that. So about 10% of our students um, are migrant students. Um, you'll see we're right here where the star is. So we are from, we span from Aptos to Las Lomas. Um, our main um, area is Watsonville. So we are part of um, where Driscoll Strawberries and Martinelli's um, 
um, sparkling apple cider comes from, um, that's us. Um, we've had a focus for the last two years on whole child, uh, but this year after the pandemic, we really realized that there was a unique need um, to really move towards um, not only whole child, but whole child, whole family, whole community. Um, and so we've we've done that. I'm just talking about you know the voices of our of our families. So we survey them significantly. Um, one thing I always say is let's not survey them and ask them questions, um, and then not use that information to really move it forward. Um, so we actually have a current survey that's happening as we speak, but this is results from the May 21st survey. Um, and one thing that we saw, and I won't go over all the results, but one thing that we saw was that we had a significant number of families and students that were saying that they were worried about going back to pre-pandemic um, experiences and that um, they had significantly had um, their mental health impacted by COVID. So if you look at this one that's right here in the middle, you'll see that 79% of our families and, um, and students said that they had moderate to significant impact um, with, um, with COVID. So um, we looked also at our other data. So we had both site and district wellness teams. So kind of talking about how did we continue to hear and gather and move them forward. Um, we had both site and then when they need to, they were elevated to district. And what you'll see in the left-hand side is so many of them really needed support with um, anxiety and just some social emotional needs like stress. We did also have 16% um, of our students said that they um, had a death within their family um, from COVID. So we have a lot of needs um, in terms of that. Um, and we also, we saw that the, st that the students felt a little more supported by the staff during the pandemic, which meant that what we were doing the pandemic, we wanted to continue to move um, that forward. So we decided to do a restorative start. So every single um, staff member, whether they were one of our bus drivers to one of our teachers to our management um, was provided um, training on our restorative start. So we had, um, we decided to do, to focus on six key areas. So we did two areas per, um, per week. Um, and these are the areas in which we really called our anchor strategy. So we just finished up this work. Um, and I know this is about engaging families. This um, is about starting strong and continuing to engage families. So we provided the families and the teachers with a wealth of resources um, so that they could go in and they could support their, their child as well. So this is the, this is what the, it looked like for everyone that um, touches PBUSD, whether you're a community member. So we have a large ecosystem of about 60 community partners that help us. Um, and then we, we provided these lessons um, for them um, so that we could build students um, identity agency um, and belonging. Um, we had uh, multiple sessions with our parents and had over 700 parents um, that um, in English and Spanish and Mixteco Bajo that we helped train them on the restorative start um, so that we could make that home and school connection. And so we're, um, we're proud of um, this work and um, we're always know that um, together we're stronger. And if we support the whole child, the whole family and whole community, um, we will all flourish. Um, and so part of our continuing to make sure that we're communicating, we developed, um, we developed last year a website, we converted it this year. Um, and so here you can see um, that parents can go on and get that information. We also have um, many parents who don't speak um, or don't read, they're illiterate in any language. Um, and so you'll see that we do a lot of um, videotaping of things for them um, so they can also um, watch it if they want to. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to um, share what we're doing here at PVUSD. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, good day, what are you guys doing over there in Linwood? Well, Linwood is 
We have about 12,000 students. We are located about 15 miles uh, southeast of Los Angeles, and we're considered an urban community. Uh, our demographics are about 94% Latino and about five to six African American, and it's a historically underserved community. And currently, uh, our, we have about 94% of our kids who um, qualify for free, free and reduced lunch, 27% English learners, and we have about 5% of our students who are unhoused and about 14% SPAD. And in terms of the work to support students and staff, one of the things, you know, as, as Michelle shared, is, is making sure that we take a holistic approach to supporting our students and our families, uh, making sure that our staff have the supports that they need, and also understanding that we can't do this work alone. So one of the things that we did as a district is we quickly established, for example, a hotline where if you're in a, a student, an adult, here's a hotline uh, so that we can provide some mental support, either resources or uh, direct referrals. And um, that was critical for us. And again, we couldn't do this our own because even though schools are expected to do everything, we also realized that we're not the experts in that, in that field. And so we actually partnered through, uh, we have a, we host a health collaborative and we have over 38 health agencies that partner with us to provide the support, the much needed support for our students and families. Um, and then I'll just say one more thing is that one of the other things that we did is, is we were really intent on listening and making sure that our students and our families' voices were not just heard, but that they were at the table, that they were engaged in conversations with us so that we can better respond. And as a result of these conversations, we were able to take a food pantry that was serving about 50 families a week and expand it to over 500 families on a weekly basis. We heard loud and clear from our parents and students that they wanted more access to tutoring, not just from uh, you know, three to 5 p.m., but around the clock, 24 seven. So we partnered with paper to make that happen. And then it was also about engaging in conversations with the local churches, with the city, with the sheriff's department here, in terms of how do we collaborate as a community and come together to support one another? Because again, in, in Linwood, uh, when the vaccines started rolling out, we were one of the last communities who have access to it. And so we had to advocate and bring these additional resources to our community to make sure that our, our families also had access to that. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of things going on with social justice issues, and we engaged with parents on developing our uh, parent advisory, African American Advisory Parent Council, and that was critical, uh, really looking at the mirror and asking ourselves, what do we need to do differently? And, and having these conversations with kids at the table and asking ourselves, how do we enhance our curriculum? Because the adopted materials that are out there um, aren't, aren't doing it, they're not cutting it. And kids shouldn't have to go to college to learn about Juneteenth. And so those are some of the things that we were trying to um, do here. And then technology is our families did not have access to technology. They didn't necessarily have the, the luxury to work, work uh, remotely. They, if they didn't go to work, they didn't have to, they, didn't, they, they had to struggle to put food on the table and pay the rent. And so for us, we partnered up with our local legislation to make sure that they were hearing from our students and families about the true challenges that they were faced with. And technology and internet access is no longer just about academics and learning, but it's about access to healthcare, getting a COVID test, um, employment for vaccines, uh, tele uh, mental health support. And so our, our local Senator, Senator Gonzalez, um, sponsored SB 156, which was just approved in, in California, which will help expand tech access to communities like Linwood. So I'll stop there for now, but uh, that's just some of the things that we were able to do to support the families and community here. Wow, a lot of things. Thank you for sharing that. Let's go down to my, the great state of South Carolina. What's going on down there, Barry? And things are going well. Thank you, Duane. And, and again, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, platform and this panel um, with, uh, with these outstanding superintendents from around the country. Richland too, we, we are located in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, Richland 2 is home to about 28,480 students as of today. Um, 
Uh, we are in the Northeast section of Columbia uh, and mostly a suburban um, school system. Um, we have about 3,700 employees in our school district. Uh, our student demographics uh, uh, is roughly 61% of our students are identified as African-American, 18% of them identify as white. About 12% of our student body population identifies as Hispanic, uh, about 2% as, as Asian, and uh, uh, about 5% of our students identify as mixed uh, um, race. Um, we have about 51% of our students um, from low wealth uh, home environments. Um, we are uh, an avid wide school district uh, where we focus on using the average strategies to help our students. Um, we are um, a part of the NIMC organization where we're focusing on um, uh, math and science initiatives to increase participation rates on the, for underserved uh, populations and uh, AP courses. Um, we, um, we have about 38 distinct magnet programs within our, our schools. We have 40 schools and we have about 38 magnet programs within our schools. And, and all of them are school within school magnets or school-wide magnets. We do not offer a standalone magnet program. Um, that's a separate building um, for our students. Um, we are a district of choice, which means we have, um, we offer choice and the option for students to attend schools uh, for throughout the district um, if they are able to provide their uh, transportation to those schools. And of course, through the application process of any magnet program they may be interested in. Um, we have this year, as we were re-entering school, uh, it was clear to, that we were going to be in school five days a week, face to face, and we were going to have to provide that type of instruction. So uh, we began the process, as I shared earlier, in ensuring or asking the question, how are we going to protect instructional time um, and maximize the instructional times once we had students in the building? We felt that we had a lot of the resources in place. We feel we have a lot of resources in place when it comes to providing our students with social emotional wellness. Uh, and, and, but that focus for us was not teaching SEL. The focus is on for us is creating spaces where students are well. Uh, and those spaces take place in the classrooms with the adults uh, and with the community, um, not just creating those spaces of wellness in schools, but creating those spaces of wellness in the community. So the, the ask of our, of our staff, our team this year was to recommit or commit for the first time if they've never done so to our core values to the, this idea uh, and this principle of striving to be premier, which is really finding a following and living our core values, a learning character and community and joy. So what does premier learning look like in our schools, not just for our students, but also for our staff? Uh, we talk and, and focusing now on, um, on character and demonstrating character, not only, um, not just teaching about character, but about demonstrating character, COVID, for our students, if, if, if we're not careful, um, the things that they see on social media, the interactions that they see, the civility, the lack of civility that they see uh, in this uh, through social media, if we're not careful, we will have a gen we can create a generation of students who think that's the appropriate way to respond when they are pressed and stressed and have and have anxiety. And so for us, it's important for us. For me, it was important for us to demonstrate character in tough times, in difficult times, because this isn't going to go away tomorrow. Uh, and unfortunately, even when COVID moves on, there is going to be other tragedies, dilemmas, situations. And so what have students learned about how they are supposed to respond and what, does, what has the environment done, uh, what kind of environment we've created for them? So we want to demonstrate premier character at all times. We are focusing on investing in our community and what investing in community means. So we have learning character in community. How do we invest in our community as a school system? And how does our school system invest in our students? So continuing and strengthening those strategic partnerships that we had already had in place, whether the partnership is with uh, the healthcare systems here to make sure that our students are being vaccinated. One of our big partnerships has been with the MUSC and ensuring and, Prism and, and Providence Hospital ensuring that we have the access to vaccinations for those students and families who want to be vaccinated. We host a testing site right here at our district office in our parking lot and been hosting it since really since last, uh, I think, June um, or April. Um, and it, so the community continues to come uh, to our property to, to get tested um, and get their results back in a couple of days. Um, we've partnered to ensure that the elderly have been, are being fed 
that they have some of the some of the basic necessities that they need because in these trying times and economic strain, we've seen where those individuals uh, who are most vulnerable, like our elderly, were struggling to feed themselves. So how do we partner with organizations to ensure that those individuals who may not have students in our schools, but are taxpayers and support our school systems are being taken care of? So for us, it extends beyond the building and more so into the community and how we're being community, community partners. And, and then we also focus on joy. Um, as I share with our staff this year, uh, that we are not responsible for creating or giving someone joy. That's a source that they have to bring with them from, from wherever they get their joy from. But we have the responsibility as leaders to create conditions where joy can reside. So what are our schools look like? What are our opportunities look like? What are our spaces look like? How are we contributing to creating spaces where people can bring their joy and that joy can reside? It's not snuffed out because of challenges and circumstances and, and, and things of that nature. We do all these things through five basic principle practices that govern everything that we do. Being innovative in our approaches, being data informed before we make decisions, um, diversity and inclusion is central to that, ensuring that we are diverse in our practices, in our staff, and in, we have been inclusive. And that includes all the things of bringing the, the, the right partners to the table and things of that nature. The right strategic partnerships, there should be some reciprocity in partnerships. I've been very critical and very careful with that. We have a lot of money floating around in schools now through ESSER, and everybody wants to sell us something. Everybody's hitting us for something. So where are the strategic partnerships that we're gonna establish that's gonna surpass or last past this COVID experience? Um, and then also um, continuing to invest in our community and make sure that we have a communal spirit that resides in our schools, in our classrooms, and also in the, in the larger community here in the Northeast section of Richland County. Wow, so I heard from all three of you, like your school district, it seems like the hub of the community. Like you're doing above and beyond just educating folks. You're providing a meaningful lifestyle and, and, and encouragement seems like to, to support the, the needs of the students. So now more than ever, you guys know that, you know, communication is, is vital um, for, for our families, especially our marginalized communities. Um, as students return to school, and I think all of you have returned, how are you, how are your districts continuing to engage families and community stakeholders in, in, in your decision making. Uh, Gilday, I'll start with you. Yeah, so it's, you know, as, as school districts, we're, we're trusted, uh, people rely on us, and, and that information has been critical that we disseminate that's timely, that's accurate, and, and relevant. And so for us as a school district, every one of our school sites now has a social media account we actually just uh, started up our TikTok now because that seems to be another medium as well. <laughs> and uh, for us, it's really important, you know, like I said earlier, is that our parents and stakeholders, including our students, are at the table with us, engaged in these conversations. It's not a one-way, uh, you know, uh, message, but it's a, it's a dialogue. And, and sometimes the dialogue is messy. There's disagreements and that's okay, but it's really important for us to collaborate with our community and have these conversations and do it in a way that's authentic, right? Like what is the agenda? There is no, uh, no other agenda other than what we're trying to do as, a, as an entity here in the community. And that's again, working in partnership to inspire our kids to make sure that they have post-secondary options. And so for us, some of the things that happen on a more global scale, you know, Baron mentioned this, is strategic planning, is making sure that those voices are at the table when we revisit what our priorities are and what the goals are for the organization. In California, we also have what's known as the LCAP, Local Control Accountability Plan. And of course, our parents and students are involved in that process. And it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight and it's messy. And sometimes we go in there, and you know, we have our disagreements, but it's so critical to have those spaces and then some of the things that we now do is I have a weekly call out to the community, make sure that they have the accurate information. I go on Facebook Live and let me tell you, I, I, I hate doing these things, but I have to do these things. The last Facebook Live we had, we have over 6,000 views and we do this in English and in Spanish. Um, but what's also important is 
that we have to have our parents and our students in front. So we actually have uh, some campaigns where students are on social media and helping out with that communication, that messaging, clarifying any misinformation that's out there. And we've had some parents who have gone through some trainings and these parents, they are fantastic. They are on YouTube recording themselves and going live and, and conducting parent presentations in Spanish and in English. And they're available to support families on Zoom, Google Meets, et cetera. And so those are some of the things that we've done. And on our website, and I'll put the link on the, on the chat as well, is we have a YouTube channel and we have a website where parents can go in there and get information about any upcoming uh, parent trainings and things like that. Great. How are you dealing and how are you working with parents and community stakeholders, Michelle? So just add, I'm trying to add on. So we we too, and so whether it's it's surveys, we do something called thought exchange, which allows um, parents to engage with each other in any translatable um, language, which I think is important. It allows them to write what each other is saying, and we pose. Um, really complex questions. Um, one thing that we learned through COVID is that we'll get a lot more parent participation if we do virtual meetings. Um, and so we have, every child has a computer, has their Chromebook at home, they've kept them at home. And then all of our students either have home internet or they have one of our about 5,000 hotspots. And so we, um, we have continued to do town halls. Two things I think that's unique to us um, is I do something that's called Ask Dr. Rodriguez. So every week I have families that submit questions to us. Um, and then I respond to that. So we're now, um, we now started the numbers for this year, but we're on almost number 60 of that. So we've done, I do it every single week. Um, and then I also do something called conversations with the superintendent every Wednesday. And um, because I just, I think it's so important to be able to have that um, multi-directional and um, just multi-dimensional conversations, right? So some needs to be in person, some can be online, some is through an actual message or a text um, that families get in. And then for me, one thing that we found with the pandemic that we've kept with is, and I mentioned it a little bit before, but the, the need to do um, videos. So when you have large groups of parents who are not literate in any language and you want to access your most vulnerable families, how do you do that? You do that. Um, through videos. So we do a lot of short videos in English and Spanish when we have important information coming out. I do them in English and Spanish. And then I unfortunately don't speak Mesteco Bajo. So um, we have our translator that does that. Um, but I think that way we have the ability to hear what is happening in our community, what concerns that they have, able to quickly pivot and address them. Um, and as I mentioned, it, what you what you hear and receive is only as good as the actions that you take. Um, and so I think our families know if they if they they're talking about something, expressing a concern about something, we'll we'll address it and address it quickly. Um, and so, like for Ask Dr. Rodriguez, I probably get you know 40, 50 questions a week, um, and then I pick between those questions. Um, and so those are just a few ways that we're supporting our families and communicating. Great, great. Baron, how are you engaging families and community stakeholders in your decision making? So the first thing we do is we start with any group is revisiting the mission statement of our school district. Um, and I've quickly learned that, uh, particularly during this time, there are competing needs um, of families. Everybody doesn't want the same thing. So um, when we bring individuals to the table, to have the discussions and hear their voice. I understand their voices are different. They're not speaking with one unified voice and one side of the district wants one thing, one side of the district wants another thing, one side doesn't care what you do. They just want you to tell, you know, they just want some direction. They want you to make a decision for them and they're fine with that. They can live with it. And so I bring them to the table and I wanna make sure that they are clear and understand what the mission of the district is. And so the mission is always the starting point. Uh, this next thing I, I, I try to emphasize with them is, and, and, and Dwayne, you've heard me say this, is, is, is really asking the question and being able to answer this question of how are the children? And we want the, the, the response to be all the children are well in our school district. And that helps center us 
on these in these conversations we need to have as far as what do you need to or what does your child need to be well uh, in this community and so it is through those types of things um, through through several vehicles that we're able to to get this information and partner uh, we have a relationship with the uh, ministers of the Northeast section of, of Richland, uh, of, of our school district. We call it NERMA, the Northeast Richland uh, Ministerial Alliance. We visit and, and, and have um, all of our principals, many of our principals participate in Rotary. So they're able to communicate uh, in their various Rotaries um, chamber. Uh, we also go to chamber, participate in chamber. We do Facebook lives and we take the interaction questions as they are coming through. Um, we did the ESSER three surveys where we got input from parents on what they thought was gonna be important, how we should spend the ESSER three funds um, and got some insight from parents on what that is about. We do the same thing when we do our general fund budget as most people do and try to get input from them. And I have several advisory councils um, that are working groups. This is not a, a place where they come in and they uh, are part of just receiving information we, we try to establish practices, um, problems of practice within that. They review policy and give input on policy before that policy is presented to our, our school board. Um, so I have a parent advisory council, a factory advisory council, a business advisory council, and my most important advisory council is my student advisory council, uh, which I had, you know, I had a meeting with them this morning. And they had some questions. And, you know, educating them just on what is a exactly a close contact, why you should be vaccinated so you can avoid not being quarantined should you be in close contact and why that's, how that's going to impact um, you throughout the school year if you choose or choose not to do so and what steps you need to take in order to protect yourself. Um, and then we also have, uh, we use an app on our website, it's called Let's Talk, that allows parents to send information in or ask questions and then that information is properly um, uh, routed to the appropriate person to respond um, back to parent and parent concern. And so the real challenge as all of us is facing is balancing all of that uh, and trying to be as responsive as we can as quickly as we can and also making the decisions of doing what's in the best interest for all of our students. Um, with understanding that there are going to be some that don't necessarily believe that's the right direction to go. Yeah, 100 uh, percent. Wow. Uh, so speaking on, you know, talking about supports, let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Tell me a little bit about um, Baron. How are you supporting um, specifically reaching and supporting uh, your families of English language learners, the homeless and marginalized community. How are you doing that, Barry? So we we started last year with um, doing what we call we call it the inverted the system. We started deploying resources out into the community, um, and that was because we were not in the building uh, at the very beginning of the school year last year. And so we would send our social workers, our counselors, uh, our tech support team to various locations throughout our school district. Well, um, and some of those locations even were places where we knew that many of, of our homeless students were living in like hotels. You know, they would stay in a, in a particular hotel in a particular section of town. So we would, we would send those services over there. The same thing in our, some of our, our communities where the, um, the students uh, speak um, their first language is Spanish. Uh, and so we would, we would send that, that those uh, services to those communities with appropriate people to assist them. We have always, we've had for several years now, um, a program called Cice Pareto where our, 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 we have an interpreter program where our students serve as interpreters um, for that, for our community. So we have those students who we can, we share uh, information. Um, they sit in, uh, in concert with school leaders and school administrators and serving as translators for families throughout the district. And we deploy them at, at several schools around the district. And, and, and most of them, if not all of them at this time are um, uh, our students in our schools. Um, and we're actually working on a certification for those students so they can get some sort of certification. So when they graduate, they'll, they'll have this employable skill that they can use as far as translation is concerned. Uh, social workers at every school, every school in our district has a so, an, an assigned social worker. Um, we partner with um, uh, our local um, um, mental health um, department. And so we have mental health counselors as well. 
uh, not at every school, uh, but we do have mental health counselors uh, in, in place in our school districts to assist uh, us at various schools. Um, we, we're doing some, some work um, in partnership with the chamber uh, as well as um, the county uh, to have programs in some of our high poverty areas um, um, of, that focuses on uh, adding additional supports in those communities for additional social workers, additional counselors, additional mental health uh, counselors, as well as ad additional um, psychologists. Wow, a lot of supports. Uh, Michelle, how, what are you doing to, to reach and support the most marginalized in your community? Yeah, so I think it's really two, two specific things. One is um, leveraging that partner ecosystem. So when we're talking about um, identifying with our students and, and trying to support them, we think of our most vulnerable populations and how can we get to our most vulnerable students and our most vulnerable families. And frankly, most of them, it's not through the school system. It's not through the schools that we're able to see them. So um, we have, whether it's the collective action board um, that has a lot of support for, um, for our community or it's Salupa La Gente, which is where all of our families go that have Medi-Cal for their personal health. Um, we have placed our, um, our um, staff within those facilities so that when we have parents that never would step foot on one of our campuses goes um, to get their medical checkup or have something happen with Salud para Gente, then we're able to access them and we have our presence there. And so I think that that's um, really important. We also have just really expanded um, our counseling and support services. So um, you kind of saw from the survey, we have over time since 2018, um, increase the amount of supports that we have. We're fortunate because we have our own nonprofit that um, is our, ther our therapist, it's called PVPSA. And um, so they provide supports, but we also now have many staff members that are able to provide a connected system all the way. We have a 55% increase of social emotional counselors that can provide um, emergency and very short term care all the way up to we have a 180% increase since 2018 of mental health clinicians that are our staff members that can provide ongoing therapeutic support um, for our families. Um, and so I think when we leverage both our partner ecosystem and then we try to build a connected system um, within the school through our um, site and, and district wellness teams, we're able to identify and then really provide um, wraparound services for our most um, fragile students. Thank you, Michelle. Gil Day, what are you guys doing to support your marginalized students? Oh, I mean, I won't say some of the things that Baron and, and Michelle have already uh, shared and they're doing some great things and I'm digging down notes here too. Um, <laughs> but what I'll, what I'll add is that you know, a lot of our more vulnerable and marginalized populations, it's, it's about those relationships. And you can't do it over a phone call or Zoom, et cetera. And unfortunately, we weren't able to establish those relationships in person last year. So it made it a little bit more challenging. And so for us, understanding that it's about those relationships, it's, it's also what we've also done is conducted the home visits. And sometimes the home visit becomes visiting three different homes and talking to the neighbors and talking to relatives to find out where the kids really are, because they're not necessarily in the same house that they have listed on their uh, SIS. And so going out there, getting to know them and making sure that you do it in a way that's supportive. We're not here to get you. We're here to figure out how are you? How are you doing? You know, is there anything that we can do to help? How do we get you connected back with some caring adults in a structured environment? And sometimes it's about the hotspot, right? Sometimes it was about, hey, I'm working now. I can't do these hours. Uh, are there any other options for, for me as a student? And sometimes it was about basic necessities. And we had a lot of families that were just struggling, again, with just the basic necessities. And one of the things that uh, Michelle mentioned is a foundation. So we have a foundation here in the district. And what we were able to do is through the foundation, they raised, for example, $50,000. 
And, and they, those dollars were supposed to go to our most needy families. And so in speaking with, with the families, you know, it, it was, it, we, were, we were going to give them some food vouchers or, you know, gift cards to the local store, but some of them didn't even have place to cook their food, right? And so what they asked us is, can you give us vouchers for the local restaurants? And so instead of going to the big corporations, we went to the little mom and pop restaurants and they're like, we don't even have vouchers. And so we helped them develop vouchers. And so what we did is the families got the food vouchers and they were able to go to the local restaurants. And so at the same time, we were helping the local economy, sustaining the local restaurants and the, and the employees there, while also making sure that our families had access to hot, warm meals. And so those are some of the things that um, we also did uh, to support our families. And again, it's at the end of the day, those relationships, it's, uh, you, you can't make up for that. And uh, the Zoom virtual environment makes it a little bit more challenging, but making sure that they are reassured that we're here for them, we're, we're listening, and that we're here to support them. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to remind the audience that uh, we invite you uh, to drop your questions in the Q&A option below. Uh, we're gonna switch uh, briefly over to the town hall where you can ask questions of the panelists. But before we do that, I have one more question that I wanna pitch to our panelists. Uh, what lessons have you learned from the past year about maintaining these relationships for the future? And I'll start with you, Michelle. So I think I've learned that we are more interdependent and interconnected than we ever believed that we were. Um, and then also second, that we have the ability to just do fantastic, um, wonderful things for our community. Um, so what, when, at a time when our community needed us the most, um, the school system and the partners stepped up to provide like we have mentioned, everything from food, um, food substance, um, so many families that you never think would be food insecure became food insecure. So, um, you know, we learned that can we pivot in one week and do all of this? Um, and the answer is yes, we can. Um, and so we always had a strong base um, of a partner ecosystem, but I think what it showed us was that um, we could even accomplish um, much more than we had ever dreamed that we could accomplish. Um, and then we also confirmed what I knew, but I'm not sure that staff, that all staff believed that parents want the exact same thing that we want for them. And they're just as invested in their child's future as we are. Um, just sometimes they can't be there at the moment because of dealing with three jobs or dealing with the, um, the challenges, the familial challenge that they have. So I think our, our staff now knows the power of the parent as well. Um, and that um, together, um, really all these things are surmountable. Baron, what have you learned? Um over the past and that you would like to take into the future? Um, that's a great question because I've learned a lot. <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot uh, since, since we started this. Um, but I would say the biggest lesson, maybe one of the biggest lessons that I learned is that you can't show the responsibility of this by yourself. That you have to have systems in place to do the work that's required in order to ensure that all your students are well. And as the leader, sometimes you, you often try to shoulder too much of the responsibility for yourself if you're not careful. Um, and so this is an opportunity uh, in tough situations to watch your talent shine. And when I say your talent, I mean your organizational talent, your community talent, your student talent. You can watch that shine by bringing those talented people together and having them work to solve these real problems. We used to do problems of practice and everything that we did, this is a problem, this is a, this is a problem of, of practice uh, front and center. And so I've learned to, to uh, put things in place 
that allow those individuals to do the, to, 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 to do the things that they're talented and skilled at. Um, and it's those individuals like your social workers who come up with the programs that really um, are beneficial in helping your community. It's your nurses that strategize with your operations staff to come up with the vaccination clinic so that the logistics flow smoothly and that um, they have all the details figured out. And you just need to pull those pieces together and make sure that they have the support and the resources that they need so that they can support the community. So that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest lessons I've, I've learned. Yo, Dave, wrap us up. What, what, what are some lessons you've learned? What else can I say? It's, uh, you know, I think leadership matters, right? Yeah. Is we all, we all understand how important it is. And I think that districts and organizations who were intentional, collaborated, and, and acknowledge that we don't know everything and we can't do everything. We're actually the ones who took more initiative and were more proactive to support and better respond to the different situations and circumstances because all of us were being forced to do, be out of our comfort zone. And it also just reminded me that there's hope. When I see our kids is you know, the hope that they give me that things are going to get better and that we have a huge responsibility on our hands that we need to do right by them. So that when we look back at these experiences in these years, I wanna know and be able to look in the mirror and look to them and, and know that we did the right thing by them. Awesome, awesome. So now we're gonna uh, switch over to our Q&A session from, from our attendees. I have one question already uh, waiting for you guys. Um, and Helen stated that parents work 2,000 hours every year and students are in school for only 1,000, I guess, hours a year. Um, would love to hear how you support the out-of-school time in your districts and how you engage with communities in out-of-school time. Anybody can go for that. Well, I'll jump in um, on that. Um, uh, and, and I'd say this is with, with with all humility and, and respect. Um, one, we do have after school programs in our school district where our students are engaged in extended learning, particularly as a result of COVID. So we have extended learning programs um, that our students are engaged in several hours after school. Um, but I will say that that's a, that's a great question because it's one of those things uh, that schools can't do alone. And it's one of those things that now is the responsibility uh, the, the question was preference that parents work 2,000 hours and students are unattended for, you know, they work 1,000 hours, so they have this unstructured time. So the school has to figure out what to do with that unstructured time after having them for the, for the morning to the afternoon. That's now the school system's re responsibility. And, uh, and so um, uh, we have to put things in place. But the question I would ask is, is it, we need assistance with those types of things. Because um, in, in what concerns me are the students who don't come to the after school programs that are in the communities where they need to be somewhere other than in that community. So then what are we gonna do as a community to ensure that that student is safe and well and taken care of while that parent is working second and third shift and he or she is home alone or with a, with a younger sibling and they have adult responsibilities. Um, but my students that can come to school, have the school programs and have the access and the, and the resources to do the things that they need to do, um, that's great. But I'm really concerned about those students who can't do that. Yeah, and just to build, build off of that, I think the community partners is, is so important and that it's something that builds off of the talents interests and passions of our students. So we've done a lot of work with building the partnerships so our students have things to go to after school that they want to. We have an extended learning um, program as well. And so that's always there, but now we have partnerships, whether it's LC Stema that um, does um, orchestra or it is Latino Film, um, Latino Youth Film Institute that is working on um, script writing and filmmaking with students, that there's opportunities for students to say, I love and, and have interest in this. And so let me um, build off of that passion, interest, and talent so that I'm doing something that is worthwhile. And then 
I have always believed in 24 seven learning. So we do, I think digital programs are a great um, equalizer um, if you can get families um, into doing that work. So we have a whole bunch of programs, but for us, one of them is Footsteps to Brilliance that at this point, um, we've now had it for four years. Our students have read in after school time over 200 million words. Um, and when we think about, um, you know, whether it's how can we accelerate um, vulnerable students, a lot of it is how do we provide them additional instructional time, but during doing something that um, motivates them and makes them um, want to engage with us. And so now with uh, all of our students have Chromebooks and all of our students have um, internet, how do we help them to, how do we grow that number so that our students that need extra support in math can do Map Accelerator or need additional support in literacy can do Power Up. Um, and so those are some things we're doing and my extended learning program would be mad if I didn't mention, we also do um, STEAM backpacks. So anytime that we have any type of a break of more than um, a day, so we don't do it for like a Monday off, but more than a day, then we provide um, backpacks that are filled with um, art and music and science supplies um, so that students are able to engage at home. Um, we panned out 10,000 backpacks um, and they go like that. Um, and um, so I know our, our community appreciates that. Awesome. Good day. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we all have the after school programs, but not all kids uh, have those opportunities necessarily. And even within our own systems, we can accommodate all kids. I think that, you know, the bigger question going to Baron is, is how are we as a society really making our youth a priority? Because you can provide some enrichment and after school academic support, but our kids also need internships. They need hands-on experiences. I'd rather have them here because I know they're going to be in a safe, structured environment as opposed to being at home where they may be unsupervised, playing video games or doing other things. Um, but ultimately, it, it can't just be on the backs of school districts. It has to be a collective effort to support all kids including our 17 and 18 year olds. I want them to have internships and be there getting some hands-on experiences and, and that remains a struggle. Yeah, wow. So as we wrap up, I'd like to thank you guys for, for joining us. I have one last question. It's gonna be a lightning round. So I'm gonna give each of you 30 seconds to answer this question. For a the school leader out there listening today, maybe we'll listen to this recording later. What's one thing they can do today to help bridge the gap between and, and become a better leader and leveraging their family and community uh, even more immersively? So what's one thing you would pitch them that they could do tomorrow to, to get it to get that done? Yeah, uh, I'll start off. I you know, talk to a student, get his or her perspective in terms of where they're at, what supports they need. What are some of the things that we're doing well and what are some of the things that they can use more of or a different type of support? I mean, ultimately we're here about kids, but oftentimes their voice is missing from that conversation. Yeah. I would say, let your mission drive, let your mission drive you. Um, because I think in every school district, their mission is focused on all kids, all students, all families. Mm -hmm. And really work strengthening your 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 channels of communication with with your families and understand that communication is two ways information can be one way and so creating spaces and opportunities to have continuous dialogue with those important partners of your school district and that's parents as students that's businesses that's the elder those those elderly families in your communities that's whatever, the breakfast clubs, wherever, where you ever you can have open dialogue and communication um, with those, those important partners. Strengthen that. And, uh, and, and, and secondly, I would say, get you a great, a new leader, get you a great, great advisory, personal advisory team in your community. People in your community who will be honest with you, direct with you, 
who have your best interest in heart and also have the best interest of that community heart. Establish you a team that you can sit down with that can counsel you as you're making decisions that impact the community. And, and they need to be diverse and, in, and diverse in, that, in, that, in, in, their dim, in their makeup. And then I would just say, listen authentically and be willing to pivot um, and iterate often yeah. so that you truly are aligning your actions along with that feedback. Um, and then most importantly, and it's, it's harder to do than it, it, it sounds, align every single decision with what is best for students and families um, and not always what's easiest or sometimes even best for the system. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Gilday Crosswade, Dr. Baron Davis, and Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Please follow these great leaders on Twitter. Uh, they are always doing great things here in the league, and we are so fortunate to have them in the League of Innovative Schools. Thank you once again uh, to these three individuals for sharing their expertise with us. I would like to remind you that we have two more uh, uh, webinars coming up in our Reopen Strong series. Uh, on September 22nd, we have teaching and learning and assessments. And on the 29th, we're gonna dig deeper into uh, data privacy and data equity. We have rescheduled that to the 29th of September. So the new date for the data equity and privacy is the 29th. To register, please go to bit.ly. Uh, the bit.ly uh, is on the screen. Uh, and, and if you want to watch any of these recordings after we've concluded our webinar series, you can go to our YouTube channel on Digital Promise. Thank you once again. And we ask that each of you to continue to stay safe and continue to do right by students.